Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe, maybe. So you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh, yeah, somebody wants me. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. Uh, this is episode number 13. And my pleasure today to have the Hargrave Military Academy postgrad coach, Coach Tom Messenger, joining us. Tom, good to see you this morning. Man, great to see you too, Corey. Appreciate you having me on. I was doing the math. You and I have known each other, I think, since you first started at Hargrave back in 2012. Yeah, it's been, yeah, it's been, it's hard, hard to believe it's been that long. My back just got a little bit sore when you said that. Yeah, uh, I've been, been here a while. I know. I think in the first kid was uh, Brooks Ely. Um, mm -hmm. we got connected there from one of my players from Lexington Christian Academy back in the day. And, um, he was part of that magnificent team there that I think, correct me if I'm wrong. Didn't you preseason sign 12 guys D one. And then the other two signed D one at the end of the season. Is that correct? That was actually the following year. So Brooks was on the national championship team the year before that 15, 16. And, uh, I'll never forget. He came in, he came in the national championship and, uh, hadn't, had him played as many minutes as he wanted probably in the two games leading up to it. And we were down by eight against St. Thomas Moore and Brooks came in and got a huge steal and then banged a three as soon as he got in the game and really gave us some life. So Brooks is, uh, he's going to be forever remembering Hargrave lore for, for that play to kind of turn that whole game around. Yeah. And then Brooks ended up going to Glenville state, uh, started there immediately as a freshman played two years and then actually bumped up to the D one level to Northern yep. Kentucky. So that's, you know, it's a story you haven't heard much in the past, but it's becoming more and more a reality nowadays. Yep. So um, you're at Hargrave now, but I know you were from Massachusetts originally. Um, Northampton, one of my favorite towns, because yep. Wilson Northampton is there. And I know you come from an athletic family too. Um, did a little research on you with my crack investigation skills. <laughs> and um, tell me a little bit about growing up and, and your family and their sports and, and why you picked basketball. Yeah, it's... Uh... My, my family, you know, sports is always kind of at the center of my, of my family. And, uh, you know, my mom was a great volleyball player um, in high school. Her team was actually inducted into the Connecticut Sports Hall of Fame. She's she's the best athlete of the bunch. Uh, no, nobody else will really admit that, but she, she's the best athlete of the bunch. Uh, my dad was a big-time soccer player, played at Campbell University. Um, and they went to the Final Four when he was down there as a defender. Um, my brother played baseball at McAllister. Um, and I, I grew up uh, – you know, my, my dad coached at Smith College. He actually coached at Williston as well. Um, coached soccer at Williston for a few years. So I kind of grew up running around those fields. Um, but sports, again, were always just something that was central in, you know, in my experience. And I think when I was a kid, I kind of looked around and said, well, my dad played soccer. My brother played baseball. My mom played volleyball. What can I do that's different? You know, the, the youngest child always wants to do something different. So, you know, I picked basketball despite being, you know, 5'11 and can't jump over a candlestick. Um, so it might not have been the best decision for me, but, you know, I just, I loved it. And, uh, you know, from the, from the time I was young, the connections that I made with people, you know, coaches and players alike through basketball have been, been awesome for me and transformative and, you know, forming me as an adult. So wouldn't take anything back, but it's been a, it was an awesome, awesome time growing up with all the, all the sports that would, that'd be floating around and going to practices and just picking up everything from, from my dad, my mom, and my brother. Yeah, and you ended up doing a postgrad year. Tell me about that decision, and 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 tell me what schools you were looking at, and why you picked uh, the one you picked. Yeah, so uh, I did a postgrad year at Deerfield, um, and I, I, growing up in Northampton, obviously we're right down the road from Deerfield. Um, I'd always known about Deerfield and the reputation had academically specifically, um, but I had a connection with Coach Wong, uh, who was who was the coach back then, Glenn Wong. Um, I, I played in a, in a UMass slash Amherst professors pickup game, um, on, on the weekends when I was, when I was growing up, um, Ray Harper was my high school coach. I uh, used to bring me over there on the weekends and, uh, I'd always play in that game and, and coach Wong is actually, you know, in that game every weekend. So he had kind of been subtly recruiting me for, for probably eight years up to that point. Um, and then when the time came my senior year, um, I was young for my grade, I uh, wasn't really developed physically and, you know, really was, was looking at a post-grad year. And when, when coach Wong said he'd love to have me at Deerfield, I went all in on it. Um, I was lucky to get in. 
Um, I had about a 3.4 GPA in high school. And if you know Deerfield, that's a, that's a stretch sometimes. So uh, I was lucky to get in and then made the most of it. And my year at Deerfield was, was incredible. Um, you know, Coach Pritchard is actually there right now is one of my assistant coaches. Um, so he, he's a wonderful guy. Um, and again, it, it set me up for, for success in basketball, but then also academically, because what I, what I told everybody was no matter what school I go to, I can go to an Ivy League school. No matter where I go, it's going to be easier than what I did mm-hmm. this year at Deerfield. So it uh, really did prepare me for, for that next step. Well, that's great. So when you recruit, recruit kids for your postgrad team, you can actually give them your experience of leaving home and doing the year. So I think, I think that's a great asset you have. Yeah, absolutely. And I, again, I had some, some opportunities to walk on at division one schools and had some scholarship money thrown at me from division two schools and ended up going D three after my, my year at Deerfield. And I can kind of talk guys through that process and you know, what was important to me. And um, it's a, it's a good experience to be able to give that perspective of, of what it's like to, kind of make that next step that's an untraditional one for for a lot of guys yeah and you know when you were at emerson college you were the team mvp uh, at one point and being a 511 guard you know you and i get reached out to every day by guards there's there's mm-hmm. more than enough guards out there and you being 511 you know what what advice do you give smaller guards on how to get to the next level because it is so cutthroat it is such a, mm-hmm. a small margin for error you know based on your personal experience what what are your thoughts to to share in that information with kids? I think you need to have something that's tangible that you do exceptionally well. Um, I could really shoot the ball. That's all I could do, but I could really, really shoot the ball. So that, that was a skill that translated for me. Um, knew I wasn't going to be, uh, you know, 30 point per game score. Um, knew I wasn't going to be, you know, the best defender in America, but I knew if you passed me that ball and there was any kind of daylight, I, I was going to put it up and more often than not, I'm going to, that shot. Um, so that was one skill that kind of translated for me. Um, now, again, I was a division three player. Uh, so if you go up to the division two level, and then especially the, the division one level, you can't just be able to make shots at five eleven. 11. Um, you need, you need to have other things that you can bring to the table. Um, so as you go higher in, you know, in college basketball, you need to bring more things to the table, but coaches need to be able to hang their hat on. This player is not going to be a liability defensively. They're not going to be able to post them up. He can you know, guard 94 feet. He can hit shots, take care of the ball, all that kind of stuff. So that's why small, as you go down the levels, you tend to see the heights go down. Not necessarily the skill set's a little bit different, but, you know, when you're smaller, you need to be able to do more things to, to be able to contribute. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, and that's good advice for, for kids listening out there, for sure, especially the guards. Um, when did you realize you wanted to be a coach? In a way, it's always kind of felt inevitable to me. Um, and growing up with my dad, like I, I literally was was in a huddle or a practice every single day growing up. Um, so it kind of it kind of just bled into me. But uh, my college coach Hank Smith was somebody that I I admired, and the impact that he had on me, not just basketball wise, but just in life, is something that I wanted to emulate. So it kind of solidified, you know, while I was in college and. I thought I wanted to go play overseas a little bit and then uh, realized that, again, I was 5'11 and couldn't jump over a a candlestick, so that might not have been the best career option for me. Um, You know, I had that that pivot and and, uh, was lucky to be able to to land where I did and kind of work through, um, you know, my my career here to to get to a really great spot. Gotcha. And and where did you start coaching after? Where was your first coaching job? So my first coaching job was actually at Belchertown High School. Um, it, it, it's a, it's a random stop for me, but we, uh, I got my master's degree from Smith college immediately after I graduated from Emerson uh, and worked for a program called project coach, uh, which actually goes into, I don't know if you're familiar with Springfield, but we went to Springfield, um, high schools and kind of recruited high school age kids, to kind of train them to be youth coaches in their community and partner up with elementary schools and and try to improve life outcomes and, and things like that from, from that program. So I was doing that program. Um, and one of my old high school coaches, Claude Humphrey was the head coach at Belchtown high school. Um, so while I was doing that program for a year, I hopped on, I was an assistant with him. Um, so that was actually my first coaching job was uh, an unpaid volunteer at Belchertown high school uh, for, for a year while I was getting my master's degree. And then how'd you end up at Hargrave? So 
Hargrave had actually reached out to me um, while I was looking for jobs after I got my master's degree. Um, they saw my resume on, on a board somewhere and they were looking for an admissions counselor with market with a marketing background uh, and an assistant varsity basketball coach. Uh, they were looking for somebody to fill both those roles. So I had a degree in marketing from Emerson and obviously I had played and coached a little bit. Um, so they reached out to me and uh, from the time I had my first conversation to the time I stepped on campus was two and a half weeks. Mm, that's crazy. That's a quick turnaround. It is. For, for people that don't know about Hargrave, why don't you give me a snapshot of the Hargrave school itself, uh, maybe it's tradition, and then obviously your, your basketball program. Yeah, so uh, there's a lot of misconceptions out there. The, the word military being in the middle of, of the school is always one that, that can cause some, some kind of anxiety or fear for, for guys when they're thinking about school. But, you know, I, I'm biased, obviously, but I think Hargrave is the best school in the country. Um, the military side teaches our guys a structure, a discipline, and an accountability that they're going to need no matter what they do in life. Um, you know, the majority of our guys don't go on to military careers. Um, that's not the goal of our school. We're a college prep school. Uh, we just use that military structure again to kind of help guys learn life lessons. And, you know, one of the, the biggest things for us, one of the biggest benefits for us is that the military structure that we have on campus actually mimics what guys are going to see at the next level. Uh, and that's one of the biggest misconceptions for a lot of younger guys is, well, I have to work really hard now. And then when I get to college, I'm going to party all the time and sleep in and not go to class and just hang out and go play and hoop and, and be a celebrity. It doesn't work that way. You know, coaches are going to expect you to wake up early, do a workout, go to class, be on time for your study hall in the afternoon, do a team practice, have a team function in the evening, and then there's going to be a GA running around knocking on your door, making sure that you're, you're in your room at night so you can sleep and, and do it again the next day. So our structure here really mimics that and allows our guys to be able to step in at the college level and be prepared for that grind. Whereas most freshmen step in and it's a completely foreign thing for them. Um, so that's kind of the background of the, of the military side of, of Hargrave. Um, it's a world-class education. We've been around since 1909. Um, the post-grad basketball program started in 1990. Uh, so we just celebrated our 30 year um, anniversary on that. Uh, 374 players have come through during that time. I, I just did a, a cool project in my, the hallway leading up to my office where we put a placard up for every single player that, that's come through, um, which is really kind of overwhelming to take a look at. Mm -hmm. um, but we've had hundreds of division one players. We've had 27 NBA players uh, since 1999. Corleone Young was actually our first NBA player. Uh, went straight from Hargrave to the NBA, uh, the second round pick for the Pistons. Um, and Corleone actually is, is still involved. Um, follows up on the guy with our guys and uh, is a great, great supporter of our program, which, which is cool. Um, you know, the coaching tree here has been, has been pretty incredible too. Uh, if you look at the tentacles that have gone out, not just as, head coaches, but also assistant coaches at, at the division one level. Um, Kevin Keats kind of started the current trajectory that we're on um, Scott Shepard before him, but, but under coach Keats, the program really kind of took off. And then uh, coach Hamilton, uh, coach Keats, obviously the head coach at NC state now, and then AW Hamilton took over for him. Uh, he's now the head coach at uh, Eastern Kentucky. Lee Martin took over for him and he's an assistant with Ohio who just, uh, won the MAC tournament. They're going to they're playing UVA in the first round of the NCAA tournament. Um, then I'm lucky enough to take over for Lee. So I've I've kind of learned from from all of those guys and kind of taken pieces from from all of them. Um, and the the one thing that stayed consistent is the heart rate style. Uh, we're going to press. We play up tempo. Uh, if you look at film of, of heart rate for the last 15 years, you're probably going to see a lot of a lot of similar concepts. But it's it's been good for us. It's it's, it's worked well. So we're not going to mess with success. Yeah, and I try to be unbiased uh, bystander, but I, I've said it that, that you guys, in my opinion, are the top prep program in America. And I know that's hard to say with all the other competition you have. And the reason I know that firsthand is I've sent three kids there and you guys have done just wonders with them. But um, it's just one, you have that, that history, right? I don't know if anyone else has that many NBA players and, and maybe Brewster uh, would be you probably have more because I think Jason has 14. You guys had 20 some, but um, you know, I, what I say about your place is that you got to be a special kid to go to Hargrave, right? right. You got to have to deal with the grittiness of 
you know, the town. Uh, and that's not a bad thing. It's just you're in the middle of nowhere. All right. Your, your facilities, your dorm rooms are grittier, a little bit more barrack style, which is fine. Um, and then it's, you know, your weight room's sweaty. Your practices are cutthroat. Like it's, it's, it's a legit spot. And I only, you know, suggest guys to you that I think could handle that grind. And you're absolutely right. Most prep schools will get you ready for college. Yours though, um, you know, just because I've got a 10 year military background myself, I just, I can appreciate all the extra benefits kids are going to get out of that military structure. Do you think that military structure adds a little bit something more versus just going to, let's just say Hargrave was non-military yeah. school. What does the yeah. military aspect aside from what you said about bringing structure, because I think you're going to get that other schools as well, but does it bring another flavor to the kid that maybe another place wouldn't? Yeah, there, there's, there's no doubt. There's no doubt. And, you know, as a, as a team, you know, and you can appreciate this too, with your military background, you know, you, you come together with those shared experiences in, in a different way. Um, and even if they're not always the, the fun experiences, you know, even the challenging times can allow you to bond a little bit more. And then, you know, beyond that, you hit the nail on the head with, and grittiness you know we we don't want this place to be the Ritz Carlton we, we don't want you to be comfortable because again if you it's really easy to kind of lay low and sleep in and not work hard and you know just wear baggy clothes and do all that kind of stuff it's hard to wake up early it's hard to be clean shaven it's hard to always look sharp it's hard to be on time for everything it's hard to grind against 13 other scholarship level players every single day in practice to get no days off it's hard to wake up again and do it all every single day. Like that's a hard process. But if you want to achieve an uncommon result, which is playing in college, playing in the NBA, at some point you've got to break off the easy path and do something that's hard. You know, if you, if you do what everybody else is doing and you're comfortable and easy, you're going to get the same results as everybody else. And the results that we get here and the results that our guys get, those are uncommon results. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about our current COVID times right now. Um, are you guys looking at adding a second post-grad team next year? We're, we're toying with it right now. Um, the demand I think, I think is there. And one thing that we're, we're really sitting down and making sure that we, we do our due diligence on is can we still support and promote those guys the way they deserve to be promoted? Because the last thing that we would ever want to do is bring guys in, sell them a dream and not fulfill on. Um, so we're, we're going to do our due diligence before we, we sign off on that one way or the other and make sure that if we, if we do move forward with it, we're a hundred percent sure that we have the resources and, and uh, kind of back end support to, to make sure those guys are getting what they need. Yeah. The biggest challenge I see Tom in the second post-grad team world is can you place those guys? And right. now you're probably seeing this year, how difficult it is to place your D one guys. Right. So that's a question I always ask coaches that are going that way or already have gone that way is, how does that placement work? Because families are expecting that no matter if they're the best kid on the team or the kid at the end of the bench. Um, and speaking of that too, how has your placement of players been during COVID? Have you placed all your guys yet or is there still guys trying to sign? And what's that been like you trying to get college coaches' attention? Yeah, it's been, it's been a challenge this year. Um, you know, the, the most common kind of refrain from college coaches is, I don't even know how many scholarships I have right now. It's, I don't know who's coming back. So our guys are getting a lot of attention. They're getting a lot of looks. We're having great conversations with coaches, waiting to sift out a few of them until, until kind of this, this postseason time clarifies itself. And uh, we have seven guys right now that, are, that have already received Division One offers. Um, we've got another couple that are, that are right on the verge there. Um, then the rest of our guys have got a lot of D2 NAI attention. Um, so we're, everybody's going to find a home, a good home. Um, but it's going to look a little bit different than it has in, in years past. It's probably going to be a later timeline than, than it ever has been, which is nerve wracking for, for both coach and player, but I think uh, an inevitability at the times. Yeah. And with this being, you know, with your experience now placing your current guys in COVID and seeing how challenging it's going to be now and for the next couple of years, is this changing what kind of kid you're recruiting to your team? Not really. Um, you know, we, we always take guys that no matter what are going to fit with, with what we do and the ethos of our program, you know, we're not going to sacrifice on, on character to get the talent in. Um, so when, when you get the right guys in our environment and they work the way that we know they can work, that still has a value to college coaches. Um, so we're not, we're not recruiting to the, to the end game there. 
Uh, we had, we had, we still have faith in our process. And like, we have, we have guys that in a normal year probably would have gotten some high major, more high major looks than, than they have this year, but they've kind of scaled down a little bit. They're still going to find a great home and they're still going to be successful when they go there. Um, so we're, we're still looking to bring in a hard grade of kid, no matter what. Yeah. And tell me about that with, with you finding your players, how do you do that? Is it, is it, guys reaching out to you do you know is it uh, cold call emails do you guys actively recruit kids yeah it's kind of a combination of all of them um with the connections that we have with, with college coaches we'll, we'll get a lot of tips from those guys uh, saying these are players you need to look at um we get inundated with emails and calls uh, as, as a staff every single year uh, i think this year coming in we had two thousand inquiries um player players that wanted to be a part of our program um, so we sift through those and then, you know, we go out and we call AU coaches, high school coaches that, that we've known in the past and just ask, Hey, is, do you have anybody or have you seen anybody that, that we need to be on? So it's kind of a combination of, of all three of those, but it's a, it's a highly selective process. And, you know, again, what we tell our parents is we want, we want to bring in the right guy who really wants to be here, who's ready to work, uh, and that we feel is going to, is going to fit in with, with the ethos of our program. Yeah. I know in the old days uh, when I came through there, um, you guys had a great presentation you did for kids. Do you still do it? Similar, similar. Okay. So, some, some things never change. So every, every player that's, that's come through uh, Hargrave, I think since the Keats era, uh, has, seen, has seen a recruiting video and then, and then heard about the three things they need to be successful at Hargrave. Mm -hmm. So I think so, some things, again, we're, we're not going to mess with that success. With the NCAA making the rules they're, they're making right now about granting extra eligibility, uh, law schools not requiring SAT and everything, uh, and allowing transfers to play right away, this has to be frustrating to you. Um, if you could tell the NCAA to make a change that would help you and your kids out, what would you suggest? Well, the, the old construct was obviously the, the best for us, but, you know, I'm in terms of what they're doing for the kids, I don't necessarily disagree with what they've allowed these guys to do. So selfishly, it'd be easier for me and, and my guys to get placement if they if they didn't make those rules. But I think they're they're serving the players, their, their current players at the NCAA level correctly by making those decisions. So I can't I can't knock the NCAA too much uh, just because they're making my job a little bit tougher, making it a little bit harder for my kids to get seen. Um, that's a a selfish viewpoint that I, I can't quite can't quite put out there in the ethos. Gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> That's fair enough. Um, your social media presence is great. You're constantly promoting the guys playing in college, playing in the NBA. What was your what's your thought process behind that? Do you do you see that leading to getting more qualified kids reaching out, or, or what's your what's your thoughts on the way you're doing your social media? Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, it's easy because there are so many of them. I mean, it's not like we're we're pull, we're grasping at straws trying trying to find content there. We we've got a lot of guys that are playing at the next level and, and doing great things. Um, you know, it's kind of twofold. Number one, again, it gives us some good exposure so guys can see this is the the outcome. You know, of going to Hargrave. But then also internally, uh, it's it's a source of pride for our faculty and staff and administration here. They can see, hey, this guy that you know we put all this time and effort into over his year at Hargrave look how successful he is at the next level. And, and it kind of reinforces that this program works. This school is really special. This is a really tangible way for us to see the, the fruits of that labor that and as a, as a high school, you know, administrator, teacher, everybody can relate to this. You don't always see it day to day. You know, sometimes you have to get removed from it to see the impact that you have. And that's a way for us to, to celebrate that as well. Yeah, no, you guys do a great job. It's, it's every day. It feels like when I go on Instagram, I see 10 new, NBA player highlights that all come from Hargrave. So, and I've, and I've got to give a shout out to, to Dave Bentley, um, who, who does a lot of that work for us. He's unbelievable, um, does all kinds of stuff behind the scenes for us. And he knows every single player south of the Mason Dixon line. I mean, literally every single player. So he's a, he's a, he's a home run hire for anybody looking to, to add a staffer. Well, that's the next question I want to get to is Hargrave's always known to have great assistant coaches and a lot of them are on D1 staffs now. Heck, some of them become D1 head coaches, right? In AW's right. case. So um, tell me about your assistants you have this year and, and what you look for an assistant and kind of what their roles are at Hargrave that might be different from other prep schools. Yeah, so our, our guys are, are involved in the kids' lives basically 24-7. Uh, we actually have two of our assistants that live up on the barracks. They have apartments. Um, so they're 
they're in the thick of it every morning. They, they hear Reveille just like the kids and are, and are waking up at 6 a.m. Um, so they're, they're involved in every phase of the, of the guys' lives. So it's a, it's a different kind of relationship that the assistants have at hard grades compared to a traditional prep school, just in the sense that they're, they're with them all the time. Um, the, the bond between assistant coach and, and players is a special one at Hargrave. Um, I've got Ryan King, uh, who's been with me for, obviously this is my first year, but he's been with the program for five years uh, in a variety of roles. He actually played at Hargrave uh, and then played at Virginia State. Um, great with the kids, unbelievable rapport. He's somebody that can, that can handle a lot of the fires on the back end um, that you know, the head coach can or doesn't necessarily need to deal with on a daily basis. Um, he's incredible with that. He's also our strength and conditioning coach. Um, and if you were to, if you were to line up our staff and pick out who, who you'd want to, to lead you in your strength and conditioning program, he'd be a pretty easy first selection. Um, so it's pretty clear that he, he does a good job with that. Um, but he's done an unbelievable job of getting our guys' bodies ready. Uh, and if you look at we have a before and after series that we show our guys every single year, what they look like when they came in and then what they look like after the year at Hargrave. Um, and that strength and conditioning program is a huge piece of why they see those improvements. Um, you know, you can look at an example of even last year, Gabe Wisnitzer, who came in, you know, admittedly with a little bit of baby fat still on him uh, and then left just completely chiseled and ended up going to Louisville. Um, incredible trajectory. And, and coach King is a big part of that. Um, and then I have Tommy Freeman, who was one of the best shooters ever at Ohio University. Um, he does a lot of work with our bigs. He's kind of our bigs whisperer. Um, so every, every big that you've seen come through in the last three years at Hargrave, uh, Coach Freeman's had a huge, huge hand in that, which is ironic because he never played any defense or got in the post at any point in his, in his career. Um, but he's kind of taken a passion to, to learn about that position um, does an unbelievable job, works his tail off. He is always recruiting. Uh, I get two or three texts every single day with, with videos that I need to look at. He said, hey, look, look at these guys. I think we can get in there with them. Just on the road all the time, um, relentless work ethic. And then Zach McDaniel joined us this year. He was actually a, a GA at Eastern Kentucky last year and played at Hargrave um, in the 13-14 season. Um, so he's back at his alma mater. So you know, we have two guys that went to Hargrave, went through this program, understand what it's all about. Um, and Coach McDaniel is, he's our grinder. I mean, he does every single thing that we ask of him, never complains, loves Hargrave, loves these kids. Um, just an unbelievable guy. So I'm, I'm lucky to have the, the staff that I have for sure. Yeah, and your staff is represented by a guy that played D3, D2, D1. So you guys know every loved one can, right. can speak honestly with these kids about where they're at or what they should expect. Um, and that, tell me and that's I, important too, because you know, division one is not the, the only option for everybody. And there's no, there's no slight, and it's not, it's not a reflection on you being a bad player. If you go division two, or if you go NAI, or if you go division three, college basketball has incredibly high level players at every single level. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It, since 2012, since you've been at Hargrave, can you share with me a story on a kid that uh, maybe you guys weren't that high on coming in and he just exceeded everyone's expectations and really took advantage of the year. Yeah. You know, there, there's a, there's a kid named Justin Brown um, who actually is graduating from USF this year. Uh, it was one of my favorite success stories. So he played at Spain park uh, in Alabama, really good player. He's six foot six lefty and shoot it. Good athlete. Didn't have any kind of recruitment coming in. So we, we took him in and we, we didn't really know what we were going to get. Um, and he, this is funny, he's going to, he'll probably be mad when I say this, but I'm going to remind him that he literally didn't make a three-pointer the whole first semester. I mean, he could not hit the broad side of the bar, just missing everything, getting in his own head, could not hit his shot. Came back from the break and really put it all together. And, and he put in the work all throughout, um, preseason, lifting, every day in practice. He was establishing himself as a player that needed to play. Came back from the, from the break and, uh, and started hitting everything. And he was one of our best players down the stretch. He could defend, bought in fully to Hargrave as a school and the program, ended up signing with USF um, and started almost every game of his career when he went down there. I mean, the trajectory from where he came in to where he left was, was incredible. And he's an unbelievable kid. His family is awesome. Uh, just one, one of my favorite success stories in, in my time at Hargrave. Oh, that's great. That's great. And that can happen over the course of a postgrad year. 
Um, tell me a situation without naming names where a kid came in and it did not work out. What would have been the instance where it didn't work out? Yeah, de definitely not going to name a name, but you know, there, there have been some guys that, that came in that were, were really highly recruited early on. Um, and that, that kind of led them to their work ethics kind of bleed over the years. Um, and then, you know, Hargrave is a place, like you mentioned, you've got to have a little bit of grittiness. Like you have to love basketball. You're going to make sacrifices to come here. You have to love basketball. If you've been told that you're great your whole life and you've been allowed to coast and kind of walk through things and just be better than everybody. And because you have stars by your name, if that's your expectation coming into Hargrave, it's not going to work out for you. Um, so this, this player actually ended up signing a, a high major scholarship um, at, out of Hargrave. Didn't, didn't make it when he, when he left. Um, but really it was, it was just that, that sense of entitlement that doesn't work at Hargrave. Um, and there, there, it doesn't work most places in life, but, but at Hargrave in particular, if you, if you come in entitled and think things are going to be handed to you, it's going to be, it's going to be a tough experience for you. Um, so he ended up not playing a whole lot for us here. Um, you know, had some, some off the court stuff that we were trying to, to pull him through. Um, but that's kind of the, the one that sticks out to me is when you, when you came in with stars and thinking things are going to be handed to you, it's a, it's a rude awakening in a place like Hargrave. <laughs> right. Right. Um, tell me this, when you're not coaching basketball or in the gym, what are your hobbies outside, uh, outside the court? Yeah. I, I love hanging out with my dogs and my wife. Uh, we have a house here in Chatham. Um, they're awesome. They're, they're absolutely crazy. They're out of their minds, but they're a lot of fun to be around. Um, and then I'm, I'm a sports junkie. Uh, so away from basketball, I, I watch mixed martial arts fights with my dad every single weekend when they're on. Um, I watch Premier League soccer. Uh, soccer's probably my favorite sport to watch. I'm a Chelsea fan, uh, unfortunately, in recent years. Um, but that, that's kind of my life kind of revolves uh, around sports and, and different sports and just love to, to see people compete and see different strategies and techniques that, that can play out. When you're watching March Madness, are you going to be cheering for a couple teams in particular, or are you cheering for individual Hargrave alum? I cheer for all my guys. Um, I, I grew up a North Carolina fan, believe mm. it or not, even, even being in Massachusetts. Um, so every year in my bracket, I have to pick North Carolina to win it all. Um, that's just kind of, kind of a tradition for me. Um, but obviously, you know, my guys, the, the whole – the whole Ohio staff has a pretty, pretty tight Ohio, uh, Hargrave tie. Um, so I'm going to be rooting for the Bobcats to do pretty well. And we've got a couple of guys over at Tennessee. So if we could somehow have a, an Ohio Tennessee national championship matchup, that'd be, that'd be phenomenal for me. Oh, that'd be great. Uh, last question. What's your favorite movie of all time? Goodwill hunting. How about them apples? <laughs> How about them apples? Yeah. It's a, growing up in Massachusetts. If you, if you don't like goodwill hunting, uh, you might have to check, check your ID and see where you're really born. Yeah, no, that's a great, great pick there. So, well, Thomas, hey, thank you very much for coming on the Prep Athletics podcast today. Uh, you know, you're a good friend. It's, it's fun uh, following your progress now, your first year as a head coach. And, um, you know, I look, I, I'm just looking forward to following your progress throughout the years and um, just keep doing what you're doing at Hargrave. I appreciate you having me on, Corey. I love – I listen to all these podcasts too. So uh, I lo love being on here and supporting you guys because you've been a great supporter of us too. Thank you very much for that. All right. Thanks for tuning in to the Prep Athletics Podcast. We'll see you next week.